it was a time in my life where I was terrified and I was confused and there was a little bit of hope at that place, but there was also, I have feelings of feeling so gross sometimes being there. And I felt like I was lowering myself to that, you know, like I'm trying to hook up in a restroom on the side of a freeway. I mean, do you have no self dignity at all? Hello, my name is Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. Okay, so what I'm about to say, I know is going to sound a little bit wanky. It's going to sound a little bit like I'm over-intellectualizing something that doesn't need to be over-intellectualized. But if you just hear me out, then maybe you'll come to agree with me too. Or maybe you won't, and maybe that's fine. But uh, yeah, let me just say what I'm going to say. So cruising spaces, right? Like on paper, yes, they are all about going, finding someone to have sex with, and then going home. But in actuality and historically, they are much more than that. They are places where you can find someone who is like you, who has the same kind of experiences and understanding of the world as you. And you can kind of feel less alone, right? You can kind of convene with people and come across. Oh, I just said come across. I didn't really mean it that way. And uh, meet people that will help you to feel seen. And that is exactly what happened with this week's guest, former RuPaul's Drag Race contestant Tempest DuJour. Now, whilst Tempest was at university, she found out about this rest stop that was between Salt Lake City and Provo in Utah, and that men went there to meet, and she went to find out a bit more. We talk all about the space and what it meant to her, what it was like to grow up in the Mormon church, and I find out about a man who had cherry-smelling balls. Yep, that's right. You didn't miss here. Cherry-smelling balls. Hmm. So I guess we better get into the episode so you can find out what the hell I'm talking about, right? Let's go. Does this place have a name? It doesn't, that I'm aware of. Did you ever refer to it as anything? Um, the rest stop on the side of the freeway. It's not very <laughs> catchy, is it? No, I mean, there really <laughs> wasn't a name. Um, it, it was just a place you stopped and used the bathroom, used the restroom. So if it didn't have a name, how did you find out it existed? It was just one of those sort of not even urban myth because it was real. It was people said, oh, that's where gay guys go. It was just one of those rumor things that you just learn about. And, and of course, it's, it was from someone who I'm sure had visited that place for the same reason, but acted as if they were just trying to t- tell me something oh, okay. scandalous. I just want to warn you, t- just so you know, that's where the homosexuals yeah, go, right? Yeah, I, And so by the time you were in university, had you gained your membership into the... Secret Society of Homosexuals? <laughs> well, can I give you a little background? Of, oh, please do. It'll yes. make more sense culturally. So I was raised as a Mormon. That's a tangent in itself, right? All the bizarre rituals and practices and beliefs of that religion. And, and, and so just really quickly, for someone mm-hmm. who knows nothing about Mormon culture, what's the underpant thing? It's uh, <laughs> the magic underwear, as they're referred to. Yeah. They're referred yeah. to as garments in Mormon culture. And essentially what they are is they're underwear that have little embroidered markings on them that are supposed to remind you of the oaths and covenants and promises you've made to be a good Mormon. What, so you, like, you read them when they're around your ankles? Well, you know, <laughs> they, evolved, they evolved from being to the ankle and to the wrist to being like a boxer brief short and an, just uh-huh. an undershirt. So they're much easier ah. to hide at that point. So. And are you supposed to feel like that's what you wear every day and that's there to remind you? Yeah, you never take them off except like if you're doing sports, you would take them off or 
mm-hmm. but you're supposed to keep them on. And, and, you know, growing up in that culture, there was all this lore about how garments had saved people's lives and they were in a house fire and they were burned in their whole body except for where they had their garments or someone shot them, but it didn't have an effect because they had their garments on. So there was this sort of magical sort of uh, mythology about them. So why wouldn't you just keep them a whole body then? Because then it would protect everything. You would think, right? I guess yeah. they covered the vitals. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I've taken you off. So, so there was a whole culture. That's what you were trying to tell me. Yeah, so, so what peop- a lot of people don't understand is when you're a part of that, it's a, a culture in itself. It's not just you go to a church service once a week or on holidays. Mm-hmm. No, it's every day. All your friends are Mormon. Everything you do is Mormon. We went to Mormon religion classes every day before high school at 5.30 in the morning. And then we had religion classes at school and at university. It was a Brigham Young University is the biggest private university in America. And it's owned and run by the Mormon church. So everything was that culture. And the school is it was huge. I think there were 40,000 students and everyone was Mormon. <sighs> everyone that lived in that community, in that valley, in the part of Utah was Mormon. So it was, a, it was a bubble that we lived in of that. So anyone who also knows anything about that culture and that religion knows that they are vehemently opposed to anything gay or to mm-hmm. any kind of equality or acknowledgement of gay people having the same rights. So All this was very secretive and having even gay feelings and expressing them openly would get you expelled from school. Ah. You would be expelled. And there were a special like police force on campus that were secret, that were plainclothes people that would go to the restrooms and go to try to find the secret gay people and and expel them. And it, it was, it's so crazy Nazi sounding, but it was all true. And Brigham Young University famously did electroshock therapy on gay people in the basements of a building on campus where they would put electrodes on your genitals and then show you gay porn. And if sensed arousal, they would shock you. And they did lobotomies on gay people in the 50s and 60s in this town. Oh, wow. It's really disturbing. And I, and I wish uh, – there's a couple small documentaries about it, but I wish someone would really expose it. And so then if we go back one more step – When did you first have an inkling that you might not be heterosexual? Very, very young. I remember my grandmother used to get probably seven, eight, ten years old. We have this horrible gossip rag called the National Enquirer Mm -hmm. (laughs) that you buy like when you're checking out of a grocery store. It was all gossip, you know, newspapers. And I would take them from her and cut out the pictures of the cute men and keep them and hide them in my bedroom. And that was very young, so... Do you have any examples of who the cute men were? I, you know what? I remember being obsessed. <laughs> there was an actor named John Eric Hexum, and he was this sort of strapping blonde sort of Adonis of a man. And he only did a couple films in the late 70s, early 80s, and then he died on a movie set, I remember, tragically. But, but oh. I don't know why I was obsessed with this guy, but I was... <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> so I would look for his pictures and, and cut them out and secret them away. Do, should I ask this question? I'm yes, you ask should. This question. What did you do with these pictures? <laughs> <laughs> I would just look at them. This was before puberty and before, you know, you find ways to express your feelings. But I also would get these catalogs from stores and I'd go to the underwear sections of men in underwear and tear the pages out and, you know. Classic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nothing that a lot of people haven't done or do. But, um. but anyway, so you were cutting out pictures from National Enquirer. Right. When did you make the, like, oh, this means this connection? That's a good question. Um, when I was 11, 12 years old, I lived overseas in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And I remember we took a holiday to Greece and we were on the island of Mykonos. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew nothing about what gay meant or gay was, but I remember mm-hmm. seeing gay men and just whooping it up and partying and having a great time on Mykonos. And I just remember thinking, God, that looks so fun and how amazing that would be to be part of them. And that's when I started to make a connection about mm-hmm. the way I felt and hoarding these underwear pictures and, <laughs> and, and what that might actually mean. Because I still didn't feel at that age, I wasn't feeling sexual about things necessarily. Yes. Know? Yeah, yeah. So you had this epiphany in Mykonos. How many years before you were like, I need to 
do something about this? Within a year, there was a, a boy that went to my same Mormon church, and he, we were the same age. He was, he was maybe a year older than me, but he was well into puberty, and I was just beginning. <laughs> and he instigated our first physical experience, which was, uh, wow. which I look on fondly wow. now. It was like a fun, interesting way to like experiment and learn. But how did it happen? How did he initiate it? You want me to tell you honestly? Because this is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little embarrassing because it's so funny. We used to have these markers, these colored markers for coloring. Mm-hmm. Each color was a different flavor or scent. Like one smelled like grape <sighs> and one smelled Amazing. like cherry and one smelled like lemon. Yeah. And he goes, do you want to smell my cherries? And he had drawn <laughs> red cherries on his balls. <laughs> and being naive, I was like, Sure. So he whips his pants down and shows me his cherries and thus began the fruit basket experiments. Yeah. And you've never been able to eat cherries ever again. Oh, I love (laughs) cherries. (laughs) Still one of my favorite flavors and scents. You weren't expecting that, were you? And then it just naturally like evolved from there. Yeah, it was like, oh, I'll touch your cherries and I'll touch everything else. And yeah. (laughs) And that went on for like almost two years. We would sort of secretly get together. So why do you think he picked you? That's a really good question. That's an amazing question. I've never considered that. I don't know, because my older brother was there too when that first incident happened. Wait, what? Wait, you sniffed someone's balls in front of your brother? I just looked at them and just sort of like, <laughs> you know, as you do. Yeah, in front of my brother. This, oh, this just gets weirder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my very straight brother. I think it was this kid was so raging full of hormones. I, and I'm in this now with my own children. Like I have a 12-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. So I'm seeing the raging puberty hormones and it's giving me a lot of like recall of my own experience and the things you do or say or think is normal or, you know, expressing your hormonal urges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after the cupping incident, (laughs) were you like, yeah, I'm all in? Well, it was, it was interesting because I knew from my religious upbringing that was wrong in some way that we weren't supposed to be doing that, but it like, it felt great. And we continued to do it. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to look him up (laughs) as an adult. I don't know where he is. Do you have any clues? Maybe our listeners can help. I don't. And I don't want to give his name because I know that <laughs> I know that he was married with children, at least at one time. Okay. Um, but if anyone out there knows someone with cherry balls, get in touch. <laughs> which that draws cherries saying? on their balls with <laughs> markers. Yeah. Let me know. Hit me up. Tempest Jour at Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> but, but outside of the moments that you had together, what were you processing? Like, what were you thinking about those incidents? All I knew is that it felt good like emotionally and physically. Mm -hmm. And you know, when that happens, you don't feel like such a weirdo when there's someone else who's willing to experiment in the same things. Uh, There's comfort in it, I think. Comfort and Mm -hmm. massive guilt all swirling together. And so was it one of those things that you just knew you had to kind of keep to yourself? You had to maintain a secret in order for it to both continue and for you to get through it? Yeah. Yeah. But it was confusing to me too at that point in my life, I'll say, because I, I was living in, in Saudi Arabia and we can't, there's not enough time to go through like culturally the sexual ideas and, and etiquette and practices of that culture. But mm-hmm. suffice it to say, men were very affectionate with each other in that culture that I witnessed. Mm-hmm. It was regular to go outside and see Saudi men holding hands, kissing each other. Yeah. It was normal in that society, and that was very confusing to me. It, it looked amazing, but it also was very scary to me. So I was getting all these messages you know, from home and church about any kind of like sex before marriage was just horrible and wrong. Mm-hmm. And then I'm feeling like I'm completely different from everybody, and then I'm seeing this other culture that seems to think it's fine, even though that's not what it really was. But it, yeah, course, that's all yeah, I could course. process at that age. And, and like, do you remember a moment or a time when you were like, when it 
switched from being experimentation or being thoughts swirling around in your head to a point where you could specify what your sexuality was? You know, I was that kid all through high school and and college where people Mm. assumed I was gay because I was who I was and what I did and what I loved. And yeah, it was constantly for many, many years, me sort of laughing it off. Oh, ha ha ha. I'm not gay. What? But interestingly enough too, I didn't come out till I was about 30 publicly, 30 years old. And it was an experience like that, that made me come out where I was working professionally with a group of people. And someone said something about me. And one of the women I worked with said, Oh no, Patrick's gay. And I had never expressed that, but I was like, you know what, maybe, yeah, you're right, I am. And that was the whole catalyst for my coming out. Oh, wow. Because I fought, I did reparative therapies, I did all the counseling and therapies, and I I did a lot of that Ah. to turn straight through my college years. And so was that something that you willingly signed up to, or were you pressured into doing that? No, oh, I, well, I mean, it was sort of a little of both, really, because that was the culture I lived in. And there's this sort of Mormon belief that is so fucked up. Am I allowed to say that? Say um, it loud. Yeah, right? Where you live in this pre-existent life before you come to earth, and you choose these horrible things that you're going to go through in life to make you a better, stronger person. And that's how it was always justified to me, my gay feelings. Like, oh, I chose to deal with this in this lifetime so I could grow and be stronger and have more faith and believe in God. And, and, and it's just, it's so destructive Uh. and it's so creepy and it's so horrible. Like people with disabilities chose that as their thing, you know? Oh yeah. Um, And it gets really fucked up when it's like, if you're sexually abused or something like, oh yeah, you chose that. That's that's on you. That's gross. You chose to be deaf or you chose to have Down syndrome. It's so messed up. It's so messed up. And so I, I was fighting that, like, this is the battle that God wanted me to have. So I got to fight it Mm -hmm. and and get rid of it however I can. And that's why I did all the therapies. And what did the therapies involve? At the time, I don't know what they believe now, but at the time in the Mormon church, it was the way to deal with homosexuality was to identify it as a compulsive behavior and to treat it as any compulsive Mm -hmm. behavior, whether it's alcoholism or drug abuse or whatever it is. So the therapy was for compulsive behavior, which clearly doesn't work. (laughs) And they would give you books to read and tell you all these wonderful stories of people who overcame this. It's just so destructive and so wrong. And it it breaks my heart still. How did it feel in the process? Like when you first signed up to do it, to Mm -hmm. take part in it, were you at that point like determined or cynical or a third thing I can't think I of. got to a point where many of us have where it was like, I can't live like this anymore. Like literally I can't live. So mm-hmm. I, I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to deal with this or whatever it was. But I said, I'm not going to give up until I've tried everything that I've been told to do. So I did everything, including the counseling, the reparative therapy, the, the whole fasting and praying and fasting and praying and fasting and praying. I I was going to give it every shot I had so that I felt like I was guiltless going into whatever the result would be, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And are you, so it's wrong of me to to do what I'm about to do in comparing it to like dieting. No, that's not. (laughs) But like, this is the thing I can anchor it into. Like, Mm -hmm. are you the kind of person that's at the beginning of a diet? Like, yes, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be amazing. And in six months time, I'm going to be whatever my target weight is and everything. Or are you like, well, I'm just going to see what happens. It was the, it was the first option A. It was you psych yourself up and yeah, you pour yeah. everything you have into it, you know, and that's what it was. And then, and then an opportunity would come up to be physical with another man and we'd go back to step one again. And it, that repeated for years over and over and over. And so what was the feeling then after taking part in those opportunities? Terrible guilt guilt and self-loathing of self-loathing of, you know, I I'm clearly not strong enough to handle the problems in my life. I'm clearly not good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm clearly not worthy enough to have good things or be a good person. It was incredibly lonely and dark time in my life Mm -hmm. because I couldn't talk to anyone. I mean, I talked to these counselors, but I didn't dare talk to my family or our friends or everything was internalized. 
for many years. Oh, okay. So nobody knew that you were taking part in this or they knew but you didn't talk about it? Nobody knew. Uh, uh, the person that you were talking to about it, did they have a relationship with your family or was it no. at a time when you were, okay? Yeah, it was when I was away at, at university. So, And there, were, there wasn't just one. There were several counselors I went to and several different. And even mm -hmm. as I left university and uh, went to grad school and even into professional life after that, I, I still attempted these things. So. Oh, until you were 30. Mm -hmm. So what was that like then in that moment of being like, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah. I remember very distinctly the first time I said it out loud to myself and I felt overwhelming relief and great. You know, after that, I moved to New York City and started sort of fighting it again. I started going back to church again, even though I came out to myself. Ah. And and this is this is really weird and this is really fucked up. But um this was in the early 90s. And so I decided after a year in New York, and sometimes I would go to church and sometimes I wouldn't. And, and all along, I'm hooking up with guys, right? Because mm -hmm. I wanted to see what that was. And I wanted to feel loved. And I wanted to feel those feelings. And I finally decided I, I just can't do this anymore. So I thought, and this is how like probably mentally anguished and mentally ill I was at the time. I decided I'm going to just have as much unprotected sex as I can in a short period of time. And my plan is to become HIV positive, develop AIDS, die a horrible death, and that'll mm -hmm. show that Mormon church. And that's, it, it's so bizarre to say it out loud, but that was my logic in my head. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you know, the church could care less, obviously, but that was my logic. Like, I'm going to kill myself with this. Yeah, it's like, I, I'm going to be everything you said I am. Just watch yeah. me, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and during that time, uh, one of my sister's college roommates had come out as gay, Mormon as well, from Mormon family. And he had gone to the front steps of his local Mormon church and shot himself and killed himself and left a note <sighs> saying, this is wise because this church will not accept me. This church. And that had a huge impact on me. I didn't know him. I knew his sister. But it made national news. It was a big story. That deeply affected me. And it wasn't really <sighs> until Matthew Shepard was murdered yeah. That I, that changed everything for me. That changed my life. That's when I decided to fight. And what was it about Matthew Shepard's murder that changed things for you? I think I realized that could have been me. The situation he put himself in, I had put myself in a hundred times. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't know, exactly more than that. Mm -hmm. I was so moved by it. I was just so moved by it. And um, so, so that was the catalyst. How did life change from there? As, as many people do or did, I went like the extreme other way. So it was the rainbow stickers on my car uh, and there's t-shirts and- the, Short shorts? No, never, we never did that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was all, all that. And, and I came out to my parents in a weekend. I remember driving home to where they lived and I could not wait to tell them, you know, when I came out to them and it was, you know, it was life-changing for me. So you couldn't wait to tell them what right. happened when you told them? I, I remember I literally drove home, walked in the door, and my mother was standing inside. And I said, Mom, sit down. I'm gay. <laughs> I mean, all in like a minute. You know, it was very, did, very did quick. Did you let her sit down first or did you just say, sit down, I'm gay? I did. I did. I said, sit down. She sat down. I said, I'm gay. She said to me something like, well, you're still the same person to me. And then she got up and walked away. And I know she got up and walked <gasps> away and cried. I'm sure oh. she did. And then... My father, who's passed away now, but he came home about 15 minutes later, and I was still sitting where I was with my mother. And he walked in, and I said, Dad, I'm gay. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, don't give up hope that you can't change. And, mm. and I said, you know, at this point, I've tried it all, so there's not really going to be a change. And he walked away, and that was the end of it. Done. I felt amazing. Yeah, what a huge weight off to say that. Because I was their one child. I, I had three other siblings, and I was the one child that had stayed stalwart Mormon. My siblings had all sort of gone away from the church. Oh, I had, you know, stayed in and done everything I was supposed to do as the perfect Mormon kid. So, and this, um, this swing of the pendulum to uber gay. I know you didn't mm -hmm. say uber gay, but right, I'm but gonna, that's what it was. I'm going to call you uber gay. <laughs> was that like a a replacing like for like? I, uh, 
I think I was just so excited to sort of turn a light on in my life. I felt like mm -hmm. I'd been in the darkness for so long. And now I had something to believe in and something to fight for and something mm -hmm. that wasn't the Mormon church. That was my whole life. And this was way back before there was equality of anything, you know? Yeah. We were still fighting for our right to not be fired from a job just because we were gay. And I went to marches on Washington and I supported all the local charity events. And it was something to believe in that I felt like I could do mm. for good, I guess. Did you get like really obnoxious with your gayness though? No, no, no. I was never like, <laughs> I was never that guy, but. <laughs> oh, that guy. I've just known so many of them. I know, I know, I know. I, I, the only thing <laughs> I did that was a little obnoxious was I'm a big man. I'm six foot six inches, just flat footed. And I'm a big guy. I've never, never been skinny. And I remember we'd go to like gay pride parades and there would always be the protesters and I would just use my body to block them. I remember because I'm like, I'm big. What are they going to do? There's cops everywhere. They're not going to assault me. So I would go and stand in front of them or I would go stare them down in their faces and try to be intimidating because I was like oh. the big gay guy. So which was kind of dumb, but. No, well, I mean, that's power, right? That feeling of power. Absolutely. Speaking of trying to look intimidating, shall we talk about the nameless place? Sure. Uh, maybe I should explain what I just said. Just that, you know, in, in these types of places, the adopted persona that lots of people take on is this kind of like, hmm, I'm a man. <laughs> now, I'm not explaining myself very well. Anyway, it's a bad segue, but let's talk about the name of the place, right? <laughs> so, so... There was this rest stop off the freeway between Provo, Utah and Salt Lake City, Utah, the two biggest towns mm -hmm. at the time. And I had heard rumors about this is where gay people met and hooked up and everything you would do like at a gay bar except there wasn't a bar, you know. So they were drag queens? Is that what No, there were no drag queens. Not yet. <laughs> but there were no gay bars. And there was one gay bar in all of Utah at the time in Salt Lake City. Mm. And I was scared to go there because they sent – the university undercover cops there to go look for students. <gasps> no. Yeah. How would they know? I don't know. What? I don't know. But I know people who got caught there and Shit. were expelled from the university. Oh, so gosh. I, it's so weird that you would hunt people that way. I don't, you know. But anyway, I, so I heard about this place and I don't remember the first time I went, but. And to the guy who told you about it, uh -huh. do you remember how it came up? What was. Who was he I to don't, you? but I always suspected that he was sort of closeted gay as well. And it turns out he was, uh -huh. as were so many of my friends at the university. <gasps> Interesting. So many, yeah. There's a disproportionate amount of gay Mormon guys. There's been like research papers written about this. Something about the Mormon culture and ah. I don't know. Is there a connection there between the people who stay in the religion and sexuality or just people who were born into the religion? I, that's a good question. I don't know. Because that's interesting given like at what you were talking about earlier, being the only one of your parents' children who stayed in the religion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there was that thing that compels you because you want to be the good child. Right. I'm doing air quotes. You know, that was what was expected. In, in the Mormon culture, you know, at 19, you go on your mission for two years, you come back and you get married and start having children immediately. Even if you're still in college, that's that's oh, the norm. That's scary. Yeah, so that's what most of my friends were doing. Mm -hmm. And this friend who originally told me about this place is still married with grown children and still having sex with boys on the side because uh, I hear about it, you know, from other friends. So, so let's yeah, let's not talk about him. Let's talk about you. <laughs> and so you don't remember your first time there. Don't remember the first time, no. But do you remember the lead up to the first time? Like I do. I remember how scared I was. I was so nervous, and I, but uh -huh. I was so curious. And back then, you know, there was no internet. There weren't even mobile phones. There weren't. There was nothing. Mm. No way to connect. And you know, I just remember something that happened the first time I went too. So I do ah. remember sort of details of the first time. So I remember going the first time, and there was nobody there. Oh, and it was late okay. at night on the side of the freeway. And there's like acres and acres of cornfields, probably hundreds of acres of cornfields behind this place. So it was very creepy rural America. And I remember going there, nobody else was there, but I remember I took a phone number off the bathroom stall that said, I give blowjobs, da-da-da-da. <laughs> so I took the number and I called the guy. 
I mean, how, you wouldn't even think of doing that these days, but back then that was no. a thing you did. But also, I'm assuming it was a landline. Yep. What if the wrong person picked up the phone? Right. hundred <laughs> percent. And I wish I remembered that conversation. Like, did I say, did you leave your number <laughs> somewhere? Or, I, I don't know how I, but I certainly didn't call and say, hey, I want, I want one. I have know? one slab of meat here. Why don't you come suck it? Yeah. Oh, right. wow. You know the thing about you showing up and no one being there? Like, that is actually quite good, right? Like, I know it's not good because you don't get the action, but you get that, like, I can figure out what the space is like, where things might happen, and you're 100%. not, like, in front of people feeling terrified. Yeah, I got to sort of check it all out. And there was other times I went where there was nobody there, but there was times I went there where many, many people there, you know? And I and, uh-huh. and just, like, I would say a lot of gay bars back in the day, yeah, maybe 80 or 90% of the guys that were there were just looking for a hookup. But there were men who were there who just wanted to see there were other guys like them, maybe talk to someone. And I mean, certainly many of the men I met there were married guys who wanted to talk or wanted whatever they wanted, but it was a real cross-section of people. What did they talk to you about? <laughs> So you can I tell what I would have been there for. Like, what yeah, you want right? to talk to me? What? I don't, re- <laughs> you know, I don't remember the conversations. Um, I do remember a couple people that would just come and, like, get in your car and you would just talk. And I think it was feeling out the situation. It was always, mm. I think it felt like a validation for them, you know? There's someone mm-hmm. else who feels the feelings I feel, and there was nowhere to express that in that area or at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I can talk freely without fear of judgment. Yeah. So let's talk about the etiquette of the place. And before that, I guess, was it a place that you would only go at nighttime or did you ever go during the day? I don't think I ever went during the day. Always nighttime. Because there was anonymity at night. You know, you could, if you didn't want to be seen, Mm -hmm. you didn't have to be seen. You could sit in your car and there was a signal Mm -hmm. of you would flash your lights on your car and that meant you were looking or something mm-hmm. so on a typical night then you would pull up in your car and then you would just sit there you wouldn't get out of the car and go to the bathroom immediately not immediately i would usually wait and make sure there was no one there i knew and then one time oh, okay. i distinctly remember going in and seeing two guys i knew clearly they're cruising for sex and mm-hmm. our eyes met i said hi and then i went and pretended to use the restroom and then left got in my car and left Oh, they cock blocked you. They clearly knew why I was there and I knew why they were there, but I was pretending that, oh, I'm just using the restroom, you know. So, okay. And so you would typically pull up, you would sit in your car and just watch people going in. How, how long for? The, probably the longest I was ever there was maybe an hour. Okay. But typically it was more like 30 minutes tops. Towards the end of my time there, I, the police would start to show up a lot. I think it became very well known what was happening. And the police would show up and then you'd see all the cars pull out all at once and leave. Yeah, But so in those moments then when you're sitting there and you're waiting to go in, do you remember what that felt like? It was, it was a complete adrenaline rush. I think of a mixture of fear and anxiety and also like excitement of you didn't know who you were going to meet or who you were going to see, or it could be anything. It, It may be, you never talked to anyone that night, or it may be, I remember having a great conversation once with a guy from the university and we just really talked about having to deal with these feelings and no way to express them. And it was incredible. It was the first Mm -hmm. time I was being acknowledged, you know, that part of my life of, of, oh, there's someone else that feels the same way as you who's in your exact same Mm -hmm. circumstance. And there's also that thing about the freeness that you can embody when you're talking to strangers. A hundred percent, yeah knowing that I would probably never see that person again. There is a, there's great freedom in that. You can just be totally honest. And you can also yeah. be completely dishonest and be whoever you want to be. <gasps> so who, who came out then in those moments? <laughs> I remember trying to hide a lot of details of my life, mm-hmm. and I'm sure I changed details. I always made up a name. I never gave my real name. What's your fake name? Oh, they were, it was just different all the time. Oh, it, probably every time mine, it was Mine is always Ben, so just in case... Oh, oh, I Just like that. Just in case that. you that's want to nice. know, that's my go-to. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Very often I would use my friend's name who was the one who originally told me <laughs> about the place, the one that was married in the closet. I used his name a lot, which was David. But you didn't come up with like elaborate stories no, about no, who no, David no, was. No, it no, was just no. like, oh. No, oh, I, I, I would, you know, yeah, I'm a student at the university, <laughs> but I would make up a different major than what I was actually studying. Or Yeah, I, I think you know. I'm not able to think on my feet fast enough to come up with like lots of lies. <laughs> so I think I just don't answer questions instead. I just kind of like right, change right. the subject when people are up trying to <laughs> find out stuff about me. But so in your car, like how did you know oh, I'm going to get out now and I'm going to go into the bathroom. I mean, sometimes you would see someone go in who you were just very attracted to and you would just sort of follow them in. And um, and there were times I remember sitting there and there were the, the entire parking lot was full of people, but no one mm. was going in. And so I remember being like the first one to go in. And sure enough, you'd hear that door open a moment later. Someone was waiting for someone to start, you know. Yeah. And, and so then what is the etiquette once we get inside the bathroom? What happens? Let's assume that there are other people in there. What do you do? There were three stalls. There was sort of a, a stall with a toilet, another stall with a toilet, mm -hmm. and then like a urinal on the wall. But the stalls only came like mid-torso height. Okay. So you could very easily stand at the toilet and look over at someone else. Wait, what? A toilet? Wait. <laughs> So it was like it didn't have a, a door that covered. No. So if you really had to go poo, someone would oh, be watching you poo. Yeah. That's yeah. really bizarre. Is that common? It's common in America in places where they don't want stuff to happen in the bathroom. <laughs> that's sexual. <laughs> <laughs> More commonly, what they do nowadays is they cut the bottom off. So there's about two foot space from the floor to the top of the door so they can see if there's more than one set of feet in there. But what they don't realize is that gives access between stores, 100%. right? hundred <laughs> percent. I, I got to tell you this once. I don't want to forget to tell you this story. And this was possibly, I believe, the last time I ever went there. Mm. I was in Salt Lake City doing something and I was coming home and I stopped off at the rest stop and I went in and there was a guy standing in one of the stalls clearly cruising. And so I went in the stall next to him and I really did have to pee. So I was peeing, <laughs> but I wasn't also opposed to what else might go on. And he looked over and like to the point of grabbing the wall and, and physically like looking over at me. And at that moment, a police officer walked into the restroom and arrested him and said, are you okay? Is he bothering? You? I said, I'm just peeing. I'm just peeing. And they took him off. They took all my information. I got a summons to appear in court and testify against him <gasps> for whatever crime that was. I never showed up to court. I just, I didn't want to be involved. And I, to this day, I feel horrible about that because I was just as guilty as he was, really. And I played oh, it off like shit. he yeah, was yeah. harassing me somehow. I didn't say that. I just was like, oh, I'm just trying to pee and he's looking over. <gasps> yeah, I was terrified. Are you kidding? No, no, of course. Of yeah, course. Yeah. The whole situation is so shit, but that poor it's, guy. And he wasn't doing anything but looking. But he got, uh, I mean, I remember reading the crimes that they were charging him with and they were terrible. Like he had like sexually assaulted me or something. Were, were there any other times, because you said earlier that near the end, the police were showing up a lot. Were there any other times when you were there when the police turned up? I would just drive away like everybody else. If they pulled in to the car park, I would mm -hmm. leave immediately. So, But never any other times where I was actually in the little building itself where police came in, no. Oh, that's lucky. Well, okay, so the thing about being in there, that I'm, st like, I'm still kind of baffled by the cubicles and how they... Mm -hmm there was kind of no point in having cubicles. Um, no privacy, yeah. If you, like, met someone and you were like, yep, you, I want you, what did you do? Because there was nowhere to go for privacy. Well, you'd either go to your car or a couple uh -huh. of times there was cornfield experiences <laughs> behind ah. the building, which was kind of fun. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. It was fun. You're out in nature and it's pitch black and but you're just in the moonlight and you're in a cornfield and doing whatever you're going to do. Oh, that is fun. Yeah. Until you think about horror films that involve cornfields, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> More often than not, it was the, I mean, I would say 99% of the time it was in the car. 
And it was funny because the windows would steam up and, you know, <laughs> it was terrible. A, a couple of times we would drive somewhere else to try to find a private place. Yeah. Again, that wasn't always a sexual encounter. It was sometimes just talking or just getting mm. away from that location, you know. Oh, but how annoying when you go to all the effort of driving away and then they're a bad snogger. <laughs> and so do you remember like the last time you went? Or do you remember making a decision to not go again? I'm almost positive that the last time I went was that time I just described with the police coming in, arresting the man. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of at the end of my time at university anyway. So I moved away. Um, About three years ago, I was driving through that area and I drove by because I wanted to see if it was still there. And it was, they were torn down, they were gone. It's an interesting like sort of love, hate, fondness and spite for this place because it was a time in my life where I was terrified and I was confused and there was a little bit of hope at that place but there was also I have feelings of feeling so gross sometimes being there and I felt like I was lowering myself to that you know like I'm trying to hook up in a restroom on the side of a freeway I mean do you have no self dignity at all but that was the only option and and I'm going to sound like the annoying dad now, but I just wish young people could understand (laughs) what it was like. What is it that you wish that young people knew? Uh, um, Not to take for granted what they have and also maybe Mm. be respectful of the people who made it possible for them to live openly and freely. When I was on Drag Race, I was the oldest contestant at that time that ever been on there and was a lot of articles written about ageism and especially in the gay community And I still get that a lot. I'm the butt of all the old drag queen jokes. And that's fine with me. I'm proud of my age. But there's a huge amount of disrespect. And it's not just gay culture. It's Western culture in general that's ageist. But um, I just feel like giving credit where credit is due. There were people who, way braver than I could ever be, that paved the way for us. You know, made it possible for us to feel comfortable to be outside and march. And, you know, pride parades now are who has the cutest outfit. They're not political like they used to be. They used to be about politics and we want rights. And I never want to go back to that. I hope no one ever experienced that again. Mm. So, okay. All right. So let's, let's not dwell on ageism and how strange it is and what's going on with people in their brains. Let's go back to this space. And the question I have for you is when when we were setting this up and I told you what the concept of this show is, why did this space resonate for you? Why was this the space that you wanted to talk about? You know, I thought a lot about that because there are certainly many other spaces, drag bars especially, that inspired me and gave me life and hope and joy. But this is this is something that I had to come to terms with. And I think Maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would never have brought this up because it felt like shameful to me that I would even admit going to this place. But it's part of who I am. I I try to live with no regrets. And it goes back to that wanting people to understand and appreciate what they have. Saying that was a less than ideal place to meet people is an understatement, (laughs) to say the least. But it was an important part of who I became and why I became what I did and And that I survived all that and I got through the shame and I got through the darkness. And Is that a Gloria Estefan song? It might might be. (laughs) (laughs) But I think of it like, you know, you see these war veterans who are so old and they're so proud of the military service because they survived that horrible part of their life. Mm. And I'm certainly not comparing myself to military service, but that's what it feels like to me. I have pride now that I survived that and, and that... I wonder a lot about all those other guys who were there, mm. w- whatever happened to them and, you know, their stories. Did they ever come out? Did they ever, did they survive, did, you know? And what did that space teach you about yourself? Um, I, well, for one, it taught me not to be judgmental. I was incredibly judgmental at that point in my life about other people. I came from a family with some privilege and I was very lucky to grow up very comfortable and having everything I needed and but that place was a humbling in a very deep way for me. You know, this is me sometimes trolling for a hookup in a restroom on the side of a freeway. I can't think of anything more demeaning in some ways. At least that's the way I thought at the time. Mm. Nowadays, I don't care. I mean, do what you want to do, however you want to do it. 
no judgment from me. Just wash your hands afterwards, right? Yeah, please keep some hand sanitizer in your car. <laughs> but does that make any sense? I mean, it, it, you know, mm. it taught me some life lessons about you're no better than anyone else, first of all. And you survived all that as well. Look at you now, you know. If I could have seen into the future, it would have been amazing. But at that point in my life, I didn't even know if I would ever come out. I didn't know how I would ever resolve my feelings. Mm. Well, okay. So speaking of looking into the future, except we're not, we're talking about looking into the past. I'm really Mm -hmm. rubbish at segues today. If you could go back in time and run into yourself on that night, that first night that you ever went there, let's assume he's in the car, you go up to the car, you tell him to wind his window down. What advice would you give him? I'd probably say go away and never come back. Not just from this place, but from this state (laughs) and this part of the world that you're in. (laughs) Honestly, because it was such a closed-minded, conservative space and culture, it it worries me. It makes me sad. The suicide rate in gay Mormon kids is five times the national average. Oh, shit. And, And the national average is five times bigger for gay kids in general than straight kids. So... It's a terrible problem, and it, it just breaks my heart. I would tell me to go, go away. You'll find your tribe, but this is not it. And I don't regret any of that, like I said, but I think there would have been more peaceful and, and easy ways to reckon with myself than having to go through that. I think the lessons could have been learned somewhere else. And I, I, I tell people all the time, when I talk to Mormon people especially, I say, and I actually said this to a couple of professors a few years ago when I visited the campus again as a visiting professor, I said, had there been one person, faculty, student, anybody, one person out of the hundreds of thousands in this place that could have told me, you're okay, you're fine the way you are, and we love you the way you are, it would have changed my life completely, 100%. My, my entire focus and outlook on life would have changed completely. But never once, through all the confessions and the therapy, did anyone say, you're okay, you're fine, you're going to be okay. And that sounds like a self-pity party, but I just think of how powerful that would have been and how powerful it could be to these kids who are fighting with the same issues. God, I keep taking us down these horrible... (laughs) (laughs) I know, I feel like this has become very weighty and very heavy and dark. But I didn't mean it that way. I'm a happy, positive person. (laughs) Do you have any memories of queer clubbing that you want to share? Well, if you do, I would love to hear from you. Find me on lostspacespodcast.com and then go to the section share a lost space to tell me all about what it is you got up to. And need I remind you, if you have any photos, especially embarrassing ones, I want to see them. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. And whilst you're there, go and give Tempest some loving by following her on Instagram at Tempest Du Jour. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told other people who you think might be interested in hearing some of these queer stories. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.